Today I'm going to show you how I took a battered, beaten record cabinet from the late 1970s, rejuvenated it, changed it, added a couple of things, and made it look like a gorgeous mid-century modern piece. We'll do it right now. I was really happy with the responses that I got to the video I made on fixing my grandfather's 66 year old workbench. And a lot of you, a lot of you guys asked me to do another video of that kind, sort of a restoration video. I don't know if I can call it really a restoration video, that was much more of like just rejuvenating the piece and bringing it back to life. So that's what I'm going to do today with a record cabinet that I had. This has been sitting around my house for months now. I got it with the intent of making a video, but it just needs a lot of love and a lot of changing. So let's take a look at how that's going to go. Knowing that I was definitely going to want to get this record cabinet up and off the floor, I figured taking the casters off the bottom would be a good place to start. That would also give me the opportunity to take a look at the MDF on the bottom and make sure that it was in good enough shape to support the weight of all the records it would need to hold. Each of the 10 sections of this record cabinet is just about 5.5 inches wide and holds around 30 records, with a total weight of 8 pounds per section. So the legs will need to be secure enough to support 80 pounds of records, plus the weight of the record player and the receiver I'll have on top. And if they can't, then... Ooh. Now unfortunately, the bottom will definitely need to be reinforced. The MDF and the veneer are totally jacked, and we'll get to that later. But first, we're gonna take the back two panels off of the piece so we can take a look at the insides and see what needs to be done there. After finding out the hard way that there was still 50 years of dust in this thing, I put my respirator on and then removed all of the vertical slats which create the individual sections. When they built the piece, it looked like they used almost no wood glue at all, so these for the most part came right out without an issue. At this point, I took a look around and realized that while I had a vague idea of what I wanted to do, I didn't really have a plan, so I sat and stared for quite some time. Well, we're waiting. Then I realized that the first thing it desperately needed was some color, and I had some awesome green felt that would work perfect on these shelves. Knowing that I was going to use Super 77 along with the felt, basically because right on the label it says it'll bond felt to wood, I set off on the monumental task of covering every single inch that I did not want sticky with protective paper and tape. I've used Super 77 many times before, and if there is any part that gets touched by it, it is sticky and it is crazy hard to get off, so I made sure to do this at 100%. Once the front was totally masked off, I took the felt and laid it out, and cut myself a piece just longer than was necessary so I had a little wiggle room. Then I went around to the back side and made sure that that was completely sealed off as well, before grabbing the Super 77 and laying multiple coats down nice and thick. After double and triple checking to make sure that every single inch of the wood was completely covered with Super 77, I gave it a minute or two just to get tacky, and then very, very carefully laid the felt exactly where I wanted it, full well knowing that if I put it in the wrong spot and it touched the Super 77, it was as good as gone. Hey, I gotta interrupt myself for one second. If you look really, really closely, look closely, zoom it, no, zoom, zoom, good. Uh, if you look right there, you can see that the felt is not all the way up to the edge in the front. That is totally by design. I'm going to be putting molding around this later. And by explaining that to you now, it'll save me time later. So, now you know. I then added some weights just to make sure that the bond between the wood and the felt was really strong. Once I gave that some time and let it dry, I cut off the excess felt on each side found out that this worked really, really efficiently and repeated it on the bottom shelf. Which I'm not going to show you. What? Because you've already seen it on the top shelf. Oh man, I appreciate that, thank you. I later went to the back side of the shelf and using more Super 77 adhered the excess fabric to the shelf itself. It would not only be held in place by the Super 77, but also by the back panels when they are back in place when this whole thing is done, but you'll see that later. Next, I turned my attention to reinforcing the base of the cabinet, which we found out before was a bit of a mess. I took some measurements and found a leftover maple board from another project and decided that that hardwood would be perfect to use as a reinforcement. I took it over to the table saw and cut it to size, and then brought that piece of maple over to the now upside down cabinet. I used my random orbital sander to make sure that there was no finish left or no dirt on the bottom before I put a bunch of glue on and adhered the maple piece to the bottom of the cabinet using a bunch of clamps and a bunch of time. 
The next morning, I started by checking out the placement of where I wanted the legs that I had purchased for this piece to be exactly on the cabinet itself. And then, knowing that they wouldn't interfere, I pre-drilled six holes for six massive screws that we salvaged from actually our piano destruction video. If you haven't seen that one, I'll make sure to link it above and in the description below. It was awesome. Now that these six monster screws are in place, I know that the base of this cabinet is definitely strong enough to support that 100 pounds that we're looking to support. Next up is simply to add the four hairpin legs. Uh, I got these on Amazon, and I gotta be honest, I'm a little surprised at how good the quality was. Not that I was expecting them to be bad or anything, but these are super solid, and I like them. I used two pieces of green tape as spacers to make sure that everything was positioned correctly. And though it might be overkill, I used all five wood screw holes on each one of the legs just to make sure, again, that this is solid because of all the weight it has to carry. Now I knew there was still work that I had to get done on this, so in order to protect the legs, I wrapped them in plastic and some tape just to make sure that they didn't go anywhere. And I got on with the job of cleaning up the vertical slats so that they could later be put back into the record cabinet. This was really easy, I just used my belt sander and I got all of that residual wood glue off. Having covered the slit slats, the slat, the slit slats, I, I think, shoot. Slit slats? Slat slits. The slit, for the slat, there we go. Having covered the slits for the vertical slats in felt, uh, I just had to find them by feel, take a straight edge, and then cut down where they are. That way we can put the slats back into the slit for the slat. This is too many words. Uh, just watch, you'll see. I just had to remember there were four vertical slats on each of the shelves. So I'll make sure that each of those get cut, and then I'll show you how to put them all back in later. Now I'm gonna turn my attention to the trim that I'm gonna add around the shelves themselves. And there's two reasons I want to do that. The first is that I love the look of two-tone wood, so I'm going to use a very pale wood against these dark cabinets. And the second is that it'll cover all the seams where the edges of the felt and the wood cabinet themselves meet, and that'll make it look really beautiful and neat. It's time for coffee! Ah, better. Now we know that this is not a solid wood cabinet. It has what's called a veneer on it. Veneer is a super ridiculously, almost comically thin piece of hard, expensive wood that you wrap around cheap wood to make it look expensive. And I have zero experience working with veneer. So if you say, hey, Burke, you're not doing that right, you're probably correct. But I did it the way that makes sense to me and it ended up working out, so that's cool. I jumped right in and went over the entire veneered surface with 220 grit sandpaper. That's extra, extra fine sandpaper. Before marking and cutting down the trim materials that we made before, and then tacking that into place with my battery powered 18 gauge brad nailer, which I absolutely love using. I then reinserted each of the eight slats back into their slits, and now that we've cut the felt to allow that to happen easily, it did go really, really smoothly. I then reattached both of the back boards and stepped back to take a look. I love the way it's coming out so far, so now we just need to prep for the wax paste I'm going to use to finish it. I did that real easily just by using some blue painter's tape and putting it on top of the felt all the way up to the trim line at the edge. Once the felt was protected, it was time to put the paste wax on. I love the way this is starting to look with that dark color. I use paste wax because it just makes sense for my life. You can use whatever finish you want, but when it has wax in it, it protects from water, and I know that this piece is going to be living in my living room with my family and my six-year-old who spills things, so that just makes sense to me. If you want to learn more about applying paste wax and how to do that correctly, definitely take the time to go check out my video that's tagged below in the description called Restoring My Grandfather's 66-Year-Old Workbench. So here's a look at the final piece. And while I think it came out remarkably well, to be honest, especially for having zero experience with veneer before, this isn't my favorite view of the piece. I came back a few hours later, and I found this. And I asked him if I could record him, and at this point, I knew I would love this piece for a really long time, and hopefully, he will too.